Tuckman under. My name is Michelle Bouta, and I'm with the Office of Nutrition and Health Promotion Programs at AOA, AOA which is now part of the Ministration for Community Living. A very full agenda today, so I'm just going to provide a few introductory comments. I'd like to start by giving you a little bit of background about the Older Americans Behavioral Health Technical Assistance Center, which I'm going to call the T-Center for short. This center supports a partnership between SAMHSA and AOA, and it provides assistance to states and organizations as they implement behavioral health programs and services for older adults. And these behavioral health programs and services can include those focused on suicide prevention, alcohol and prescription drug misuse and, and abuse, anxiety, and depression. The TA Center is providing support through many different mechanisms. There's a series of 10 webinars, there's 14 issue briefs, and five Policy Academy regional meetings planned. And I have to refer you to the AOA website on the Behavioral Health webpage where you can access these materials as they are developed. This webinar, which I'm very excited about, we have recruited speakers from around the country that have built successful partnerships across aging, mental health, and substance abuse services. We have asked these presenters to tell us about their promising approaches to reach and engage older adults in prevention and early intervention for depression, alcohol, and medication misuse. And I should just add by um, reading what the term REACH, we're talking about making contact with individual older adults through um, groups, one on one contact through the media, uh, word of mouth through family and friends, and other strategies. And the term engaging, we mean getting seniors to actually participate in health-related activities like screenings, groups and classes on prevention and self-care. And we're all talking about speaking and working with health service providers and health needs and care. With our presenters to share with you their successful strategies to reach and, and engage older men and women, particularly those with different racial and ethnic minority um, representation, older immigrants, and free and gay, bisexual, and transgender elders. We have also recruited presenters that will tell us how they enlist concerns as presenters in program outreach and peer education, and we'll hear from an experienced volunteer. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for the webinar today. First, from Dr. Kristen Berry who is a research associate professor at the University of Michigan. Dr. Berry is also a member of the science team working with TA Center. Dr. B will talk about what research tells us about reaching and, and engaging older adults. Next, we're from Kimberly Flowers, who is an outreach clinical social worker with Elder Services of Merrimack Valley, which is based in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Kim will discuss her Area Agency on Aging Success and Reaching Older Adults in Prevention. Then we'll from two staff from the Jefferson Center for Mental Health near Denver. Tree Legault is the Project Director for Senior Re Reach, and Liz Smith is the Director of Ser Senior Services. Tree and Liz will discuss the many ways they reach and, and engage diverse groups of older adults in behavioral health services. Hear from Pat Mullins, Pullins, who is the manager of specialized services for seniors at the Council on Alcohol and Drugs Houston in Houston, Texas. Pat will discuss approaches that she and her team use in the Welderly program, particularly the strategies used to engage older African Americans. And hear from Andrea Garr, the care manager at the United Community Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin and discuss a SAMHSA-funded project which has provided mental health services to Latino elders. Last presenters are Munir Dada, advocate for the SPRI program that is seniors preparing for rainbow, rainbow years, 
and Care, the clinical director of the Montrose Counseling Center in Houston. And they will discuss their special focus on reaching and engaging older lesbian, gay, bisexual, and, tra and the transgender community. I want to thank in advance all of our speakers for their participation in the webinar today. For some housekeeping comments, we hope to have 10 minutes at the end of the webinar for questions. Because of the large size of this group, we need you to type your questions into the, the chat box, which you'll see at the top of your screen. This webinar will be recorded. The recording and slides will be provided to all who registered. If we need to quickly move past some of the slides for the sake of time, you'll be able to see the detail in the PowerPoint that you'll receive later. Now to our first grantee speaker, Dr. Berry. This is Chris Berry. Thank you for having me here to speak for just a few minutes about some of the research that's been done in terms of reaching and aging old and engaging older adults. Um, I think this will give you a little bit of backdrop for what everybody is going to be telling you about from their programs. Next slide, please. In terms of reaching and engaging older adults, the first thing you have to do is reach people. And, and reaching those who need prevention and intervention services, particularly for depression and alcohol and psychoactive medication misuse, is really the first key step to getting them some services that they need. We do this through partnerships between aging services, primary care, and behavioral health programs. Some of the strategies that get used that uh, you hear about today, our universal prevention education strategies, selective screening, um, training community members to be gatekeepers to identify and refer older adults, working with primary care settings to have um, the elders, physicians, and um, physician assistants work toward getting them the help that they need. Next. Engagement, um, to engage people in services is actually the next step and it's, it is probably one of the harder steps and keeping people in is also part of that. There are a variety of treatment techniques that have proven to be successful in working with other adults. Um, engagement in any of these activities really does require overcoming barriers to, the, to care in terms of both the older adults the clinicians, and even the provider organizations. Next. Barriers might include psychological barriers, and I think many of you have seen these barriers, worked with barriers of stigma, um, ageism. There are tangible barriers, lack of training in interventions and prevention, issues with insurance and co-payments, accessibility, transportation. Are these services available in your community for the older adults you work with? And in terms of the older adults' illness, there's issues like cognitive impairment, medical burden, and some of the severity of the symptoms that they have. All of these things have been found to be barriers. Next. But there is some research on how to engage people, and I think there's just been a few trials looking at this. A couple of interventions that we want to talk particularly about. One is called an open door intervention for depression, and this is a randomized controlled trial of a psychosocial program to work on improving engagement in mental health services for older adults, particularly those who are homebound or receive meal services. And that is something that's been going on for a while now, and it's had some really good successes so far. There's a treatment initiation and participation program for depression called the TIP, and it's designed to improve adherence and antidepressant medications, and really work on improving outcomes for primary care settings. And that 
reminding us all that it's all that it's good to work with primary care settings and to use them as part of our partnerships. Next. In terms of engagement for alcohol and psychoactive medication misuse, sort of prevention interventions for alcohol and psychoactive meds have a lot of efficacy and a lot of effectiveness. There are computerized um, or paper and pencil screening. These have been done for many years. There's evidence-based selective prevention strategies like brief interventions. There's non-judgmental motivational interventions. There have been a number of studies done in this area that have proven that it is possible to do this, that they work, that older adults um, accept these, and that they've been very successful. Next. So the lessons that we've learned from all of the research and the evaluation programs, and these are things you're going to hear from the people who we're talking today. Non-judgmental motivational approach is really important. Engaging older adults in decision making and empowering them to have some responsibility for their behavior, for how they're feeling. It really helps to do that, and older adults appreciate that. We don't use stigmatizing terms, um, and I think that makes a big difference in how we deal with people. We work with older adults in the things that they prefer to be in, so it may be that we're addressing primary or mental health concerns in their doctor's office in their primary care setting. We might be doing some of this work in senior service sections, and we may be doing this in senior centers. We may be doing some of the work in the home. We believe in an active warm handoff from either a primary care clinician to a person addressing depression or alcohol, and vice versa, to make sure that we have a really continuity of care, that there's no wrong door to enter care. Next. So we've also found that establishing partnerships between providers is really important. Um, trying to engage professionals who have a trusted relationship with older adults is useful. We tend to take an educational prevention intervention kind of focus to engaging older adults both in depression care and in anxiety care and in care for substance use. We address physical barriers, helping to arrange transportation where needed, and we try to tailor the approaches to varying cultural views of behavioral health and work with the community and the community leaders and the community clinicians to make sure that we're providing the best care that we can for our older adults. Next. Next. Okay. The good news, and there is very good news in this, is that there's reliable and valid screening methods that can be used for all of the issues that we're facing. There are brief targeted interventions that work. Treatments work. Good training available in the techniques to do the interventions and to do screening. There are new methods that are being employed to try to reduce barriers to care and help people become engaged so they can improve their outcomes. And you're going to be hearing more about that today. So now I'd like to turn this over to um, Kim Flowers from Older Services of Merrimack Valley. Um, choices for a Lifelong Journey. She's going to talk to you about some of the successes that they've had in engaging and reaching older adults in prevention programs. Kim? Uh, Kim Thank Chris. you. Kathy from JS. Um, a couple of the attendees are having some trouble hearing the speaker, so if you all could speak up during your presentations, we'd very much appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is Kim Flowers at Elder Services of the Merrimack Valley, and it's a pleasure to be on this uh, webinar to talk to you about some of the successes that we've had. 
had with many older adults in our communities. Elder Services is a federally funded, uh, a federally designated triple area agency on aging, and we cover 23 cities and towns here in Eastern Massachusetts. We've been around since 1974, and we see about 5,000 elders a month through various programs. We are one of the largest agencies in Massachusetts, and our mission is to ensure we have programs that are available to elders to meet their needs. Um, and I think that in the programs, we all facilitate independence and autonomy through information and resources. And we like to provide a range of programs that people are comfortable with to resolve their issues. So you'll see some of that. So programs that we conduct in our communities are listed on this slide. And I won't go through all of them individually, but they're based on the Stanford University model that engages elders in small groups of 10 to 18 members. It provides psychoeducation about disease management, exercise, nutrition, lifestyle choices, and it, it really works within group mutual support and problem solving. There are settings that are easily accessible to attendees, housing, senior centers, church halls, and provided at times that meet their schedules. So the group support session is especially helpful because it removes some of the isolation and, and stigma that people feel. We plan to implement chronic disease self-management for pain uh, beginning next month. So one good thing is that participants report that even a year later, they're experiencing benefits from these programs. And in fact, some of them feel so good about it, they've gone on to become facilitators themselves, which has been great. The Community Care Transitions Program is part of the Affordable Care Act, and that seeks to keep people from readmitting from to hospitals within 30 days of their discharge for the same condition. Um, not restricted to elders, and all patients at risk for readmittance are referred. We work with five area hospitals. We've screened over five, we've worked with over 3,000 discharges to date. And again, this involves that that handoff and coordination that Dr. Barry talked about to make sure that when a person goes back into the community, they're not left to defend on their own, but the handoff that coordinates those things. We have healthy ideas. We see people in their homes, uh, screen them using the PHQ-9 for depression and for those that screen on the moderate to severe level and want to work with us. We have people who work in their homes to help the elder identify issues they would work on, their goals, and then uh, we work with them in, at home on a weekly basis. So and it helps the individual develop the skills to gain control of their life and helping them to be independent through their own choices. The next one, uh, these are some of the programs that have been culturally adapted. The Spanish version of the chronic disease self-management, there's versions of healthy eating that are tailored to the cuisines of those particular cultures. Healthy ideas we have in Spanish and Cambodian, and we have case managers who are trained to be able to work with elders from those communities with both the screening as well as behavioral activation. And that's been a big part of, of how well this is received, is actually providing the, the workers, the direct care workers, who can understand not just the language but the culture. And so that's been that's worked well for us. And in community care transitions program, we have both Spanish and Cambodian um, direct care workers, which include case managers, nurses, mental health case managers. So again, you can see that working people in homes, but also providing the resources that they can trust because they know that these folks understand what it is that their community looks at, whatever, whether it's a health condition or a mental health condition, and work with that to reduce the stigma has really been um, very effective for us. Another thing that we find is that we couldn't do this on our own, and it really is about developing community partnerships, uh, not just in the multicultural community, but certainly that's a big part of it. 
We partner with Massachusetts Mental Health Association, uh, community cultural agencies such as the Asian Center, um, the Canadian Center in Lowell, Massachusetts. We work directly with them to make sure that, that we have their plan and that elders feel that they can they can work with us and, and we know what's going on in their cultures. Harvard Multicultural Coalition on Aging, um, we work several Latino health insurance programs for both referrals and integration of care. Get our referrals from health care organizations, primary care doctors, and local community health centers. So we have a really good handoff there. And our primary focus is on and Hispanic, Vietnamese, Chinese, Guatemalan, Cambodian, and Portuguese older adults. And so we have people who can either interpret or actually work with elders in those communities. These partnerships really provide us with credibility and the respect to be able to go in and, and work with folks from those areas. Finally, um, our compulsive hoarding program has been one that really speaks to almost all of the, the characteristics that Dr. Berry mentioned. We part Boston University School of Social Work. We use their model of intervention to focus on engaging the elder to determine areas that they feel they're ready to work on instead of forcing or demanding them to change. We get elders at risk that are identified by usually someone in the community, um, emergency personnel, housing, someone, but we motivational interviewing and strong alliance building to encourage them to work with us. So it really is a whole process. Work with the housing and the public health officials with us, uh, a safety risk and coordinate between what needs to be done um, from, from this viewpoint to keep the uh, safe, but also where is the elder willing to make some changes. So there's a real strong partnership that we need to have, that we have some task forces in place, as well as just directly um, communicating with each of the city and towns to work on this. And um, that's really been key. So again, the partnerships, the respect for the person's autonomy have really made our hoarding program very successful. And keeping people um, housed has been um, wonderful. So the takeaways from here are that providing skills and resources to encourage better choices, return that control back to the individual instead of them giving it to the doctor or some other professional, which in a lot of cases they probably have already done, to help them to know that they have good self-knowledge and help them really remember that they have the ability to make good choices if they have the right tools and information. This really helped us to help them bring about some really lasting change and an improved quality of life for them. So provide help in the settings that they feel most comfortable in. Reducing the stigma has been what we look at as, as really the hallmarks of our success in these programs. So I'll turn this over to the folks from Senior Reach in Jefferson County. And thank you. This is Teresa Legault, and today I'm going to focus on engaging older adults who are not coming to us for services. And um, basically, like Chris Berry had referred to, how do we reach? You know, we're not going to be able to provide services unless we can reach the population. So reach is um, providing services in a diverse, next slide please, in a diverse five county area outside Denver, Colorado. And it's a collaboration of two mental health centers and a large senior center. Jefferson Center for Mental Health is the lead agency. And so we're targeting seniors that are not coming through our doors asking for services. Um, many of the seniors we serve are frail or isolated. And so most of our services are in the home. The services that we're providing include mental health counseling, wellness services, and as part of the wellness services, we're doing things like life review and um, some art enrichment health type um, classes and one-on-one -on -one sessions. We do case management and in-home resources. And we have, thanks to a SAMHSA grant, we've got a new program where we've expanded services and try to identify seniors through screening in six primary care offices. 
Office. Next slide. We take a two-pronged approach to identifying um, this population. We try to be really creative in gaining them and have fun with it, and it's really something every level of the program is involved in from the leadership to all of us with our FEMA ground. And we're using a broad cross-sector of coordination of professionals and community members. Our program is a gatekeeper model, and um, in order to achieve what we're doing, we need both traditional and non-traditional community partners. Our traditional community partners are really important to building infrastructure so that we can all be part of the same community, working in the same direction and filling those gaps without reporting, repeating services and support each other um, would need. And those folks, a traditional community partner is someone who knows what to do um, when they see a senior that's having tr trouble. Our non-traditional community partners is one, working with them is one of the more rewarding parts of our work. And we need to be really creative in, in identifying these folks because this is someone in the community that sees somebody every day, sees seniors, but they don't know what to do if they see someone who is having trouble getting up their stairs or leaving their purse at the counter at the grocery store. So as part of this, we need to provide easy access to service, and that's the second part of our approach. Um, next slide, please. And our approach is um, Liz will talk a little more about on our Senior Friendly Call Center. Senior Reach really brings together the power of the community by working with these various gatekeepers, and so it needs to be right-sized to um, whichever community you're in. The five counties that we cover include little, you know, cities, little spots of people living in the mountains, um, casino towns, and large metro areas. And so to right-size that, you need to really get into the community and, and speak their language, essentially be their neighbor. For example, in our mountain rural communities, it was really hard to you know, get into being a trusted member if we're just going up every, you know, couple weeks and they're seeing us just now and then. So we think it's really helpful for our staff, it includes therapy care managers, various staff people, go to the food banks, hand out cheese, help carry boxes to the cars, and really get to know the people in the community. Um, staff still today buy senior meal sites and share a meal with seniors, talk to them, and participate on area initiatives in the community. For instance, our mountain communities right now have a suicide prevention initiative that's going forward, and we sit on that task force. So by working all together, um, we're able to kind of become a neighbor that's trusted. So next slide, please. Keys to really working with the population and identifying the senior that's not coming to your program is to really spread the word. And our um, we have expectation, and everyone in our program is really in love with the outreach. But in order to spread the word, you do it at, of course, every opportunity, but you also need to work with the strengths of the staff. So we're going and we're training 2,000 to 3,000 people a year. From that, we're, we're reaching seniors that are not receiving services and talking to, getting about 400 referrals. Then we talk to seniors and we end up getting about 92% of them to engage. And Liz will talk more about some of our engagement practices. But by going where the seniors are, um, our wellness classes are conducted most of the time in senior residences, in you know, in the, their apartment living areas, and having a presence, you know, sharing space and working together. Um, in doing, you know, just like a senior center would provide space and we would do the class at that. So those are a few ideas, and Liz is going to share some more with you on our um, senior-friendly approach of engagement. This is Liz Smith. Um, a number of keys that we've found uh, in terms of our, our engagement rate, and we're, we're very proud of our engagement rate really since the onset of the program. It's been over 90% consistently. And what we have found is that it really starts with the very first phone call. 
we, we take our time, we show a lot of care and concern, we don't run the older adult on the phone, uh, we speak slowly, and we really want to know, we want to take our time to know what is important to them and really what they need. We use a, a lot of principles of motivational interviewing. We really try very hard not to get ahead of our clients in terms of a kind of change that they're ready to make in their lives. And we come in with our own prescription of really what they need to do uh, to change or to make improvements. Uh, we operate from a, very much of a, a strength-based model, and re we use a, a coaching style. We don't tell people what to do. Uh, we really talk to them about what is important to them. And we're, we're very mindful of, of the language that we use. As Chris mentioned earlier, we, we, we stay away from terminology like <clears throat> calling people addicts or alcoholics. We really talk with them about their substance use or prescription drug misuse, misuse from the standpoint of, of really risk factors. And we, we've also found that embedding the substance use and depression questions in a health questionnaire and the primary care practices in which we're working has very much it has has really helped. Uh, people see this as it relates to their overall health versus people uh, asking questions that are pointed around their substance use. And lastly, on this slide, I, I really can't emphasize enough how important it is uh, for the warm handoff between the doctor and our program. It is so important to build trust with the senior and <clears throat> seniors, as we all know, certainly listen to their doctors and for them, for the doctor to be able to introduce our program and talk with the senior uh, about our program is really, really huge. In terms of lessons learned, uh, we really uh, found that it's important to train our own staff to be sensitive to the needs of older adults and caregivers and share these experiences uh, with, with our community partners and how to work with seniors. <clears throat> In terms of building a team culture and value for data collection and outcomes, with this early on from the beginning, uh, we certainly instill values of effectiveness, and that has resulted in a lot of pride in the program, increased job satisfaction among our teams. The wellness piece is, is critical. We know it is so important to, to provide wellness services for older adults. We really treat our clients as the whole person in terms of mind, body, and spirit. Uh, we, we offer a number of different classes on chronic pain, chronic disease management, life, life review, relaxation techniques, and we've also found that health literacy is so important. We want to make sure that the seniors that we're working with feel empowered and feel like they can be the best advocates for their own overall health. Uh, in terms of uh, being clear on the services that, that we offer, we feel like that's very important to understand what our own limitations are regarding our services and also for the partners in the community in which we're working. We certainly watch for uh, scope creep as well. And lastly on this slide, uh, we're very active in the, in the communities that we serve. Teresa mentioned this. We're on advisory boards of our community partners. We really try to champion their work as well. And we're very, very visible in the communities in which we're working, participating in health fairs, depression screening events, food banks. We really want to be become part of the fabric of the community in which we work. So the topic of this webinar has been really critical to our program, the outreach and engagement that, that we have um, has been very important to the keys to our success for Senior Reach. So I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker now and want to introduce Patricia Pollins. Thank you. My name is Pat Pollins and I'm manager of the Council on Alcohol and Drugs Welderly Program, specialized services for seniors. I'm today to share some of the things I've learned about how to connect with and engage older people in discussion about alcohol and psych psychoactive medication misuse in later life. My main focus today is working with older African Americans as well as older persons living in public and private independent living facilities. Council on Alcohol and Drugs Houston has been in business since 1946 and provides prevention, intervention, and outpatient behavioral health services to all age groups. 
Early program is a project of the council and a local United Way and was developed more than 15 years ago to close an identified gap in substance abuse services to the older people in our community. Our focus is on older persons or persons age 60 plus. I'm in the substance abuse field for more than 20 years. Prior to joining the council in 1998, I worked at a community mental health center where I first noticed the high incidence of substance abuse among elderly patients. Having learned so much about substance use and aging in subsequent years, I now view substance use as an aging issue in the same category and social isolation and loneliness, complex medical issues. In terms of partnerships, most of our work is done in the community since older adults are often reluctant to come to unfamiliar locations. Since congregate sites and the providers who run them are natural partners for us. Us. Service providers are also key partners, give access to their service population, as well as reassuring their clients about our motives. Changes are much greater than an older adult will follow up on a referral for an organization they know and trust than from a person they met that day. The program served more than 4,700 people last year, including older adults, families, and service providers. Approximately 47% were African American. The screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment model adapted for older adults may be experiencing medication misuse, alcohol overuse, and heart depression. We, too, we chose and we choose to implement the program in public and private independent living communities because they are underserved. They're an underserved population at high risk for alcohol and medication problems. They experience a housing change. They often live alone, generally lack family support, and often have multiple medical problems leading to multiple prescription medications. Keys to reaching older adults. While these strategies are key to reaching older African Americans, they're also useful in reaching other older Americans as well. Getting information through church groups is important because many African American families look first to the ministers in times of need. Ethnic groups located in traditionally African American neighborhoods provide access and have been extremely helpful. In a neighborhood alone in Houston, there are 23 different civic clubs. Individual club presidents are frequently looking for speakers for the monthly meetings. Participation in health fairs not necessarily geared toward older people, but toward families is always a good idea, since it's usually a family member who sounds the alarm when grandma is suspected of drinking too much. Networking with housing authorities has been particularly useful. They hold monthly meetings and generally know which tenants may be experiencing substance use problems, but don't know necessarily how to handle the issue. 
access television and religious stations frequently run interviews and programs multiple times during the day and night. Sometimes troubled people can't sleep. I've heard people call and say, I saw you on television the other night when I couldn't sleep. I was wondering whether or not I might be depressed or have a drinking problem. I do to get help. In my opinion, the number one hurdle to engaging older African Americans is mistrust. There's a terrible uh, stigma associated with substance abuse and misuse among older people that is magnified among African Americans. It's likely associated with the fact that they know someone in prison due to a substance-related crime. In some cases, it might be helpful to acknowledge the elephant in the living room and discuss contemporary and historical reasons behind many older African Americans' trust or trust of authorities just to clear the air. It's so essential to be aware of and make allowances and adjustments, educational levels, and health literacy. Finally, I think it's important to recognize and honor the Americans who come from different cultures and traditions. For example, all people who immigrated to the United States from the Caribbean or from African Africa have had different life experiences than those who grew up in segregated communities in the 1940s, the 50s, and the 60s. Finally, lessons learned. American symptom presentation can differ from what most clinicians are trying to expect as they lead to diagnostic and treatment planning problems. Impacts of culture on idioms of distress deserves more attention from all of us. Um, in the lessons learned from my own experience, the most important point I want to leave you with is that a flat asset does not mean disinterest. In whatever aspect of health and wellness you are promoting, the kind of blank facial expression more than likely indicates awareness. Expression of awareness indicates a necessity for the service provider to try to connect with the person on a more human level. African Americans as well as older persons living alone in independent living communities want and need to connect on a feeling or emotional level. I'd now like to introduce Andrea Gar. Good afternoon. My name is Andrea Gar and I was one of the managers for the program called Un Nuevo Amanecer which translates in English to A New Dawn. This program was conducted at United Community Center, which is located in urban Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Community Center, or UCC, is a community-based organization and has been serving Milwaukee for more than 42 years. UC provides a comprehensive range of programs and services in areas of human services, services, health programs, A-8 education, recreation, community development, and co-arts and events. The mission of CC is printed here on slide 37, you'd refer to later. Key partners for our program include the County Department on Aging, the of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, the Fifth Street Community Health Center and Planning Council for Health and Human Services. The 
of UNUAMERECER, or UNA for short, to reach and engage Latino elders suffering from symptoms of late-life depression. But Latinos are less likely to utilize mental health services. This is due to a number of factors. First, there's a cultural stigma with regard to mental health counseling, as well as a stigma around depression. And secondly, there's a severe shortage of bilingual therapists available to treat monolingual Spanish-speaking clients. The program was successful in reaching and engaging Latino elders with critical and effective treatment significantly reducing depression as measured by the PHQ-9. Our ship reach special focus was Latino elders, limited or no fluency in English. Many of the senior participants in UNA had limited literacy in English as well as in Spanish. Many were from households that meet the criteria for low income, according to federal guidelines, and often our seniors were first or second generation immigrants with a cultural identity and cultural traditions very strongly connected to their to the, their national origin. We believe that the key to our success in reaching and engaging the Latino elder population in Milwaukee was the fact that we first reached out to seniors that were already participating in one of the other elder programs at UCC. We have presented the opportunity to families of the children enrolled at our Bruce Guadalupe Community School, as well as the families of UCC employees and staff members. This in keeping with the old adage, charity begins at home. Ed coordination is an important function performed by the depression care manager in the impact treatment model. We established a collaborative rapport with primary care providers, by creating an open line of communication with primary care providers, as well as behavioral health providers already attending the participant. With participant consent, we created the nature of the program, the model, and line as well as follow-up depression scores. As of our early success, we were able to secure the buy-in of these providers Later, received a number of referrals directly from providers that were monolingual Spanish-speaking patients. We all reached out to and conducted presentations to providers at clinics that treated a large number of Spanish-speaking patients. The most effective outreach approaches was to go out to the individual housing communities where we knew large numbers of Latino elders lived. And invited senior participants to attend a fun activity in the community room of their apartment building that included a presentation on wellness. Our community outreach emphasized emotional wellness and derived wellness, wellness within a Latino culture framework. By putting the focus on wellness and describing the symptoms that indicate emotional wellness, we were able to circumvent the stigma that the word depression often arouses. In addition, created a metaphor, created, I'm sorry, equated it to education. Individual sessions were often referred to as classes or sessions. The station of treatment due to goal achievement was equated with graduating from the program. This emphasis on the health education component of the treatment model further removed the stigma often associated with mental health services among Latinos. Surprise, we found that as more and more satisfied and enthusiastic participants were experiencing positive outcomes, personal testimonies to their friends and family members created a very positive association with participating in the UNA program. Seniors who could relate and identify with the personal testimonies of prior participants were now eager to participate in the program themselves. Effective keys to reaching and engaging Latino elders in Milwaukee included outreach at community churches, Spanish language media, including radio and public television, 
festivals, as well as health and resource fairs. I believe that the significant strength of our program was our ability to recognize and respond to cultural barriers as they were encountered and make recommendations for cultural adaptations to a treatment model already known to be effective in treating late-life depression. First, services were delivered in a community setting as opposed to a primary care setting. A use of home visits for assessments as well as treatment sessions was made. This was due to logistical considerations, such as the lack of reliable transportation on the part of the participant. We later learned that by bringing the treatment to the consumer rather than requiring the consumer to come to the treatment, this was consistent with cultural values and tendencies. In addition, conducting sessions at the participant's home not only resulted in facilitating the development of a therapeutic relationship by fostering an atmosphere of rapport and trust, but also provided a valuable picture, a home environment, and helped to deepen our understanding of the condition and the factors that may be contributing to their depression of other cultural adaptations to the impact treatment model were made, both how the services were delivered, as well as methods for communicating and reinforcing the health and wellness messages. Next, please. These adaptations included, first, treatment provided in the preferred language of the participant by bilingual, culturally competent, the prayer managers. Say, expand the amount of time allotted for individual sessions from an hour to one half hours to allow for the circular communication style commonly found among Latino cultures. Third, expanding the number of treatment, the number of sessions for treatment. As it was applied to the general population, it includes eight to twelve sessions. We found that participants often required 12 to 20 sessions due to limited literacy, not only with respect to the ability to read and write, but also with regard to many of the concepts that we were trying to teach. We found that especially during the first several sessions, the material had to be presented over and over again and reviewed frequently throughout the process. Fourth, for more intensive case management functions to be provided by the depression care managers. Five, we find that describing the process and goals of treatment in terms of an educational opportunity proved to be extremely positive. Many participants have not had the opportunity for much formal education in their countries of origin. The opportunity to complete an educational course and the opportunity to graduate with as an achievement and a form of positive reinforcement in and of itself. And finally, we developed pictorial tools and visual aids for you to reduce dependence on written materials and replace them with graphic materials. Aids were developed to help communicate the concept behind the various response options in the Q9. In addition, we collected a number of images to use as reminders for their homework activities that were a part of their behavioral activation or problem-solving treatment. When outreach at the housing communities where the seniors lived, activity was often chupa, which is a Mexican version of bingo, where the bingo cards have pictures instead of letters and numbers. Adaptations were very successful in overcoming barriers and achieving positive results. In closing, if you're interested in reading more about the cultural adaptations to impact that made during the UNA program, I'd like to encourage you to read the article written by Dr. Shannon Chavez Correll et al. entitled, Improving Access and Reducing Barriers to Depression Treatment for Latino Elders, which is published by a journal of the American Psychological Association called Professional Psychology, Research, and Practice. I'd like to turn it over to Chris Kerr 
and metadata of the SPRI SPI series preparing for rainbow years. This is Chris Kerr. I'm clinical director at the Montrose Counseling Center in Houston, Texas. I want to explain a little bit. The Montrose Counseling Center is a nonprofit outpatient behavioral health clinic. We've been providing mental health services to the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community of the greater Houston area since 1978. We provided a, a variety of services and have a long history of establishing trust with the LGBT community. Um, we have general counseling programs. We also have specialized programs for people who are HIV positive. We have Ryan White funding that helps pay for counseling for people who are HIV positive. We have our own state license outpatient chemical dependency treatment program that's targeted to the LGBT population. And we also have a um, anti-violence program for sexual assault domestic violence counseling. And we have our own domestic violence shelter for LGBT people who are homeless due to intimate partner violence. We have a youth program. And finally, we have our SPRI program, our program um, aimed at LGBT seniors. In the beginning, we didn't, and, and in some ways still don't, have a large population of GLBT seniors coming to our services or other services that we can screen and work with um, to determine if they're depressed or if they're having other issues and want treatment. Um, we have to either attract them to our services or we have to go out into the community. Um, we started our senior work in 2005 with a grant from SAMHSA to provide mental health services. Uh, you would think if in these the day and age of budget cuts that if you put a sign out saying counseling, case management, peer support groups at cost to the participant um, seniors that people would beat down the doors for those free services. And what we found was no one came and that outreach has been um, an essential part of our programming to the seniors. Uh, in our first grant, we had eight part-time paid outreach workers who went off into the community and were peer outreach workers. So we're using the indigenous leader model. Uh, but before I say that, let me just talk about our key partners in this grant um, in the next slide has been, um, of course, AAA, and that's been very important for our the Area Agency on Aging for our sustainability uh, when the grant ended, and we've been able to sustain our mental health services with help from AAA. We worked with our local um, FQAC, which is Legacy Community Health Services, which serves the same population. And, um, but most important um, in the outreach and in reaching this kind of hidden, underserved, and often reluctant population has been the um, community social and service organizations um, in the LGBT senior community. We've had a lot of luck working with a group called LOAF, Lesbians Over Age 50, um, and one called Prime Timers, which is geared more towards senior men. Um, but we, in our outreach, the essential part of our outreach program, we have used the indigenous leader model um, to find peers um, and to, from the community to train them in the issues that we want, um, you know, to, to um, do screening for depression, to screening for other health issues, um, currently, we're screening for depression and for substance abuse, either um, prescription drug abuse, drug abuse, or alcohol abuse, um, or, or, or dependence, um, and, and then send them back into the community. And as peers, that gives them, um, in some ways, an established trust or a, a step up on establishing trust, and they know where in the community to go to find the patient we were trying to reach out to. Um, what we found um, in, in working with the seniors has been what we call the twofold resistance. You've heard people talk about that general resistance um, to mental health services because of the stigma. But we also found if you think about it with this population, um, if they had experience with mental health services when they were younger, back in the 40s, 50s, or even 60s, or anyone in their family, a parent or somebody had services, they probably didn't get very good help for things like depression. They might have gotten shock therapy. They might have gotten hospitalized. They might have had psychoanalysis two days a week with lots of money and little progress. Um, and so there's that reluctance. But we've also had to deal with the um, what we call the LGBT reluctance, which is this is a group that when they came of age and started to come out and realize that they were gay or lesbian, uh, for example, that that was often illegal, um, that the gathering places where they would go would often be raided and they could be arrested and then outed to their job and their families. Um, 
if they weren't with the proper clothing, if you're um, dancing with a member of the same sex. Some places, if you're just drinking alcohol at a bar, those were all legal and you could um, you could you could lose your job for that or be arrested. And also, even today, um, states don't have protection um, for GLBT um, people, so you could still lose your job um, and just for just because of your orientation. So we found that reluctance to. Um, it's another one because they thought, gee, if I come to this program, I'm going to be outed to the federal government because of your grant, or I'll be outed to the general community. Um, current in our grant, we are now screening for depression and suicide prevention and um, drug abuse prevention. We do use QPR, Question, Persuade, Refer, which is kind of a neighborhood watcher, a lot like CPR. We're doing adult education. And we are training volunteer outreach workers this time for sustainability to go out into the community. Um, and they do screening with the PHQ-2, the CAGE aid, uh, and then if people want services from that, that we um, provide healthy ideas. I'm going to introduce Munir Dada, who is one of our current um, advocates or peer outreach workers. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, and being a peer of the community and a member of the community, I thought it would, it would be easier for me to reach out to that segment because I'm one of them after all. But what expected and what I encountered were two very different things. I encountered an incredible amount of resistance, as Chris had mentioned, um, because of, uh, if you will, past experience. I also encountered um, very frequent symptoms of depression. In the two questions, inevitably, there was always one yes. So I have not had um, one no, if you will. Uh, I mean, two no's, I'm sorry. Um, either one yes or two yeses, and don't move to action. They were to stay uh, behind closed doors, or rather reach out, which adds um, time. It's taking a lot longer to reach out to the community than I expected. And um, it surprises me. Um, armed with that, though, I'm the one who has to adjust the expectations. We can't change them. With this, sense, I hope that um, the next generation will have it easier and the next generation will use the resources that are available to them. And with that, I'll bounce it back to Chris. So we have found, um, as part of this outreach, is that GLBT elders don't often don't really go to the typical places where you might find other elders. They're often not going out to the congregate meal sites or um, to senior centers because they don't feel safe, they don't feel comfortable, or they feel that they would have to go back in the closet and pretend to be straight if they do that. Um, what Meniere's um, success in doing the screening so far has been going actually to pri through individual contacts, going to private parties, to social events, dinners, uh, for people, get, um, engaging them in social con uh, conversation, uh, describing mm -hmm. that he's um, been working and volunteering with this BRI program and, and we're interested in depression and um, drug abuse. Uh, alcohol abuse, and then throw out the feeler. Do you think you might be interested in hearing more about that? Um, so it's turning the conversation into a helping interview and then maybe even into a screening interview. He said, you know, with our PHQ-2, if you answer yes to one or two, that's an indication that for more further follow-up. Um, and what we're finding is the walls go up pretty fast with um, when, it, when it's about depression, and it goes up really, really high when people answer yes to any of the cage questions and then to a follow-up discussion about what might you want to do about the potential for alcohol or drug abuse. Um, so it's taken a lot of persistence, and that's been our, our past um, history, taking a lot of persistence, being there, developing that trust. So what we find for GLBT elders, what they need is a, is a lot of trust, and that needs to be built over time, and it mean, needs to be demonstrated in small ways before they'll trust it in big ways. These people were much more willing to come to things like um, support groups rather than something called counseling. Um, we've offered individual counseling with licensed professional counselors. Um, but in the beginning, our support groups, um, and they said, don't call them you know, peer counseling groups because we won't come. We prefer you wouldn't even call them support groups because you just call them um, groups. Um, and people were coming to those things. I've also um, worked on offering just social events, and we're now we're actually working on becoming a congregate meal site um, 
for the OBT elders okay. um, and finding and seeing using that as a portal to our other services. GLBTs are often looking to find other people like themselves before they feel safe. We call that a dedicated program where the majority of people when you walk in the door ought to look like you or be um, a, a part of your peers that you would feel familiar with. Um, so we're starting with that. One of our learning curves is to do this with volunteers for sustainability. Um, oftentimes for our fee-for-service world, um, we can pay for counseling and case management but prevention activities and outreach are often not reimbursable that way. So working with volunteers this has taken a whole another um, level of learning because we're asking an awful lot of volunteers to engage in those social and then helping conversations. And it forces them to come out and it kind of can invade their own social life if they're um, out in the community that way. That, I will turn it back over to Alex. Okay, we'll go through um, just a little bit slides very quickly. Um, Kathy, if you'd like to just go back, I think we didn't show you the slides, but we have, have a couple of more slides based on what Chris was saying, and they'll be in the copies that you'll get. I'm Alex McNeil with the National Council on the Aging and the Older Americans Behavioral Health Technical Assistance Center. On behalf of the center and our sponsors, SAMHSA and AOA, I want to thank our presenters. Many important lessons uh, we've heard this afternoon. A few takeaways that I see um, are that, that partnerships. Do you want to move the slide? Thanks. Partnerships among aging and behavioral health services are not only important in reaching and engaging older people. They certainly have been established, and they're certainly working well in the number of communities we've heard from today. Heard that we need to reach elders where they are through the many partners developed specifically for this purpose or purposes, and um, we saw one good approaching approach and extend the reach of services um, by using universal screening. We've learned over the years that pre-screening or full screening offers an educational benefit as well as identification of those who might benefit, who might need um, behavioral health services that staff, no matter how well they are trained, often cannot judge the need for behavioral health interventions um, and who can benefit from these services without using a screening tool. We learned that um, engaging elders with relevant information is very important and, of course, being respectful of cultural literacy and vision challenges. Also heard that we should we programs can consider tailoring their based programs to a best address the target population that they are pursuing. Um, of course, in first uh, consult with their community leaders as well as program disseminators. Just other evidence-based programs, we need to confer with the researchers and disseminators to learn what can be modified without losing fidelity and the impact of the tested interventions. We all just heard about peer ambassadors and educators, how they can strengthen reach and engagement. And I'm going to turn to several of the questions that we've received from participants. Several questions have come in the chat box. You'll also have probably noticed that as each of the slides for, with the presenter's name uh, was was on the screen, their email address was there as well. So we hope if you have some additional questions, you'll take the opportunity to address them to some of the speakers uh, after you get the slides, which will be in a week or so. Okay, so now I'm going to go to one of the first questions. I'm going to direct to Pat. Pat is in Houston. Family members convince the senior who suffers from alcoholism and has been deemed to have capacity to consent by the Department of Children and Family Services to accept assistance as they are dying from self-neglect. First responders find them lying in their own fees and urine in a house, and they are often returned back to the environment due to capacity issues. Pat, I think you have some thoughts on this issue. This. Yeah, I do, Alex. You know, I 
I've I've experienced that in, in my work over the years. It's really a hard call. You know, the best thing I've learned to do is to encourage family members. We talk about a, a warm handoff, but I think a lot of times we have to really get with those hospital discharge planners or the discharge planners wherever the loved one is is before they start making those plans to send them home and just make our case that that person is not capable of taking care of themselves so they no need to go to a physical rehab center or somewhere but just really make that case. The other thing I, I, I found to be helpful is is that often as a family member we feel so alone and and up against such forces in, in trying to deal with this. So I always encourage the family members to go to Al Anon or some other support group so that they can hear about how other people have handled this issue. Because you need it you know, you need the repetition of target uh, or you pursuing these things because let alone you, you feel like it's overwhelming. very much, Pat. Uh, do other speakers would add to Pat what Pat has said? She's certainly given us a great answer there. It's a very, very difficult question. Hearing, hearing one, we have a question for Kim Flower. Kim, tell us about the yes. skills. Uh, tell us about the skills of the staff um, who are conducting the Healthy Ideas Program. Um, tell us something about the skills of that staff. Yeah, the staff who are doing that. We've all been through a two-day training to get um, in Healthy Ideas. We go through there. Um, evidence-based training. So we're using case managers and nurses who uh, would normally work with those um, those particular elders. When they go out, they are they're trained to do the PHQ-9 screening. If someone screens, well, if someone screams with extreme depression and needs to be seen um, for a suicide screen, then we have a separate protocol for that. But if a person screens between a four and higher then we'll introduce the Healthy Ideas um, program to them and see if they'll participate with it. And so we talk to them about what behavioral activation is, um, some education about what depression is, what you can change. Um, so really to let them know what they don't know about depression and that um, help is available and some of that they can they can do on their own. So it really all is through the Healthy Ideas uh, training first. We don't let anybody go out until they've actually been through the program. Am I correct in understanding that um, most people implementing the Healthy Ideas program are case managers, of whom have master's level training, but possibly do not? How do, how do you handle it in your agency? Because most of our case managers do not have master's level training. Um, many of them have um, LW, which is um, a social worker's license. Um, and for some, it's because they have uh, training already in social work. And for some, it's because they've been able to receive the required amount of um, supervision hours. But most are not MSWs. Okay. We have a question for the first speaker. So I think this is Chris Berry. Um, when you're talking about screening, could you please tell us um, the type of uh, individuals that you see screening for depression, for anxiety, and for alcohol use? What variety of the types of training needed by people who offer that kind of screening? Chris? Well, the nice thing about screening is that there are a number of screening questionnaires that are very well validated. And most 
most older adults we have found in actually a lot of studies um, are able to complete questionnaires themselves. Sometimes you know, they speak a different language, we translate things into the language, have them translated into the language they speak, or many of these kinds of instruments are already in that language. So I would say that if you're looking at screening for alcohol, um, there are a couple of questionnaires that are very good for that. There's a short it's called the Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test, the audit. The first three questions of it are very good. Um, there's an instrument called Short Michigan Alcoholism Screening Test, geriatric version um, that Fred Blow, who's another one of the scientific team, developed. And that's a very good instrument for older adults. In of depression, the PHQ-2, which I think a couple of people have mentioned, or the PHQ-9, um, if you want to use the entire screen instrument, are available in a number of languages. And these are instruments that are very good, um, very well targeted to older adults. So there's plenty of things that are available, which is great that people can use for screening. So training to, for screening is just a question of knowing what the quests are, being able to give them to somebody. Generally, people are able to fill out the questions themse out the questionnaire themselves and are pretty accurate in doing that. It's to ask these kinds of questions along with other health-related questions that we ask as part of of just regular screening that we do with older adults. You may be asking questions about their exercise, about their nutrition, about smoking, um, about medication use, about medical conditions. So hang these all as part of sort of your normal screening that you do in any agency that you work in if you add in in a few of these questions, that can be very useful. Thank you very much, Chris. But there are a couple of questions for Kim. Kim, programs that you mentioned, something that can be done in subsidized housing facility without clinicians, and so in addition, the, our person is asking whether you would be willing to share programs uh, with them. I mentioned earlier, whoever, the, whoever is asking that question, would you please send an email to Kim Flowers with your request? And her email is on was on her slide that you will see when you come. But do you want to give us an answer now? Um, I have to remember the the whole question. In terms of sharing it, um, a lot of what we're doing with the the Stanford programs, those are actually um, um, have licensing fees that go with them. So in case, uh, I'm not sure what, what what mean by sharing. We'd certainly be happy to talk about our experiences with it. Uh, so that wouldn't be a problem. But probably you're right, the best thing to do is to send me an email and I can get back to them and we can speak about it, you know, directly. Um, most programs actually aren't clinically based in terms of you need to have a clinician. You do need to have training, um, and the potatoes need to be trained. And it's likely that you'll want to have um, a well-trained facilit facilitator, one who's done um, some of the groups in other settings for, you know, you just put brand new people onto it. But for the most part, these are people who um, don't have a real clinical background, but, but they've, they've been through the training. Where these are all evidence-based trainings, there's a very strict protocol to go through for the trainings. So, um, you know, as long as you've got the training behind it, then you're qualified to, to run the groups. And they're really um, support groups, self-help, mutual support type groups. In terms of doing them in subsidized housing, yeah, we we do a lot of them in subsidized housing because we like to be able to go exactly right where people are and we'll be able to access it as easily as possible. So that certainly is something that, 
that's, that we have a lot of experience with that we can talk to them about. Thank you, Kim. I'd like to also add that the Administration on Aging's website, a.gov, if you have their behavioral health page, describe a number of the programs that were alluded or mentioned here today. Um, and then that website takes you immediately to the program websites. We have some other webinars that are archived on the AOA website as well as the National Council on Aging website um, that go into details about healthy ideas, pearls, some about impact, the programs you've heard of today. Um, our purpose today is really looking at just reaching and engaging, so we've not gone into details about the programs, but we are very glad to get anyone information on the programs. Another question for Kim about your hoarding. Um, more information on compulsive hoarding program and on universal screening tools that can be used in independent living settings. Do you have information on your website, hoarding um, program? We have um, a small amount of information, but it, um, in terms of universal screening for compulsive hoarding, we don't have a tool for that. Um, everything that we do with compulsive hoarders is really one-on-one, -on -one, um, and it's an in-home assessment. It involves actually going in, identifying what some of the risk areas are, and then it's a... It can be a fairly difficult engagement with a person because somebody who's been a compulsive hoarder for long, which most of these folks have, um, you know, they're they're not willing to trust people when they come in. They're afraid that they're going to be put out of their home or they're going to be put into a nursing home or, you know, there's a lot of fears that go along with it. So um, program itself, I do have some on the trainings. We we usually run a training. We've done a lot of trainings here in this area for compulsive hoarding intervention. We start with a harm reduction approach. Um, well, we start with engaging in a therapeutic alliance, and we work on um, a harm reduction approach just so that we don't overwhelm a person with trying to get them to do something they're not comfortable with in the first place. And then from there, go to the, the BU model of cognitive behavioral to help them to identify the relationship they have with their belongings, why they're keeping things, work through the anxiety of getting rid of things, and it's um, it's a fairly involved process, but it's been so successful here. We've been able to, um, we've seen about 500 people in the time that this is going on and kept keeping um, all but probably two out and those two decided that they didn't want to continue with the program. So I'd certainly be willing to talk to anybody who wants to about that, too. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, Chris Kerr, I have uh, some asking about where would they go in their community to find peer support for an older adult who is transgender? Any particular websites or, or agencies you would suggest? Um, it's hard to say, not knowing the community, to suggest uh, specific oh, websites or agencies. What I would suggest is um, you really need to, uh, in, in online, um, on the web, or in other sources, look up to find um, any kind of GBT service organization um, and, and call them. They'll usually be in touch with the other community resources. Um, transgender people have a very hard time sometimes each which are group, if they're male to female, female to male, often the men's and women's groups, either one of them might have a hard time uh, taking them um, out, out in the straight world. Um, and and it's, it's very tough, especially if they've been transitioning later in life. Um, there are resources online. Um, and in Houston, we do have a transgender center. We have, have um, probably three or four support groups um, out there. Certainly serve them in our, um, our counseling um, we need them to identify, you know, to, to their true chosen um, or their true gender, and then we can help them in, go into those groups here. Um, I'm, I'm a blank on trying to come up with names of, of national organizations, but I'm sure just... I'm not familiar with the name. Yeah. Michelle, would you like to mention your rear center? If you're not, I will.
I'm Alex, sure. are you talking about the which, which resource center? The the same resource center. Uh, you know, if you can provide that information, that sure. Do. Yes. Um, please just Google Sage S A G E. It is a national resource center for GLBT elders. They work with mental health issues as well as all kinds of other issues. Um, I think you could give them a call or certainly look at their materials. They're uh, based in New York. So if you go country. to the HRC, the Human Rights Campaign website, hrc.org, um, they have transgender resources, um, glad.org, um, aad.org um, does have transgender resources, um, lgbtcenters.org, that's lgbtcenters, um, c-e-n-t-e-r-s.org. Um, can talk about the uh, GLBT community centers around the country um, and give you a listing of those. Um, oftentimes, if you you know, would, it, if you're a place where like maybe the rural area or an area where that's not particularly friendly to GLBT people, if you ask around um, people, usually you'll find somebody that has a friend or relative, an employee, somebody who is the gay person um, on on staff. And if you ask them, they often can connect you. Um, it's kind of a informal social network like. This is Pat. Uh, I want to mention a, a film that I saw at the Coast Counseling Center, and it had to do with uh, uh, transgender people, and it was real accessible. So if that person could order that film, understand that it costs some money. There's a cost associated, but it was a very accessible film and done very well. Chris, can you speak to that? Um, I can't. But this, we, this is Chris again. The film was called oh, Gen sorry. Silent, G E N S L E N T. The um, producer was Stu Maddox. If you just look up um, Stu Maddox, S T U M A D D U X dot com, um, he can, he, you can rent it from them, or, or sometimes they give free access, or that you pay a fee. We showed that, and it's about GLBT elders, and there is one in there that is a transgender person, which is really rare to have a documentary about elders be able to, to be that inclusive. Um, it also shows um, a model we're trying to imitate from Boston of using the congregate meal sites um, that are specific for GLBT people as a way to attract people to isolation and to a portal into other services. Okay, we've got most of the questions. Um, maybe for a minute, Teresa, could you tell us, or Liz, do you have any effective neighborhood watch type programs to find the seniors falling through the cracks? If you could just very briefly give us the gatekeeper model and perhaps give someone a reference to um, where to find information on gatekeeper. One of the things we do, this is Teresa, and we will go into the communities and talk to their neighborhood groups. Um, that could be, you know, one that's over the different rules and regulations in the group or even knitting clubs, go into the libraries and talk to groups that are meeting there. So really it's actually in your each of your community in order to access people, you need to go to where the people are. Um, there is a way to research that. I, oh, I think I would start a minute longer to say goodbye. Um, just being out to the fairs that are there or any area where seniors or, you know, the community members that you're trying to reach are at fire departments, um, for any kind of mail sites or gathering spots. It could be churches. You know, we've worked with elders at churches to be eyes and ears of the communities. It's kind of you limit yourself. If you really open your mind to any kind of avenue of reaching people, we do have a triad in, in Kansas, um, a replication program uses triad, which is a combination of community members, law enforcement, and senior serving agencies. And those three groups get together monthly in our area and have trainings around, you know, safety and identifying um, maybe risks like flu risks or, you know, a variety of different things. And anywhere that people are gathering is a good approach to gatekeeper models. That's what's coming to mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.
much, Teresa, and perhaps that uh, participant wanna, might want to send Teresa an email. Um, thank you all very much for participating. We had more than 900 people register, and we've had well over 600 uh, participate today. The next scheduled webinar will be available uh, uh, for aging service professionals and behavioral health professionals ac across the country on October 17th. We will be discussing financing and sustaining older adult behavioral health services. Again, the, it will be scheduled from 2.30 to 4 Eastern time. In November, there will be a webinar on family caregivers. And in January, we're going to repeat an earlier webinar on suicide prevention. Please remember that this webinar and previous ones, as well as issue briefs that the center is developing, are available on the AOA website, the National Council on Aging, and AOA.org, as well as the National Association of States United for Aging and Dis Disability, NASHUAD, and the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, NEPID, their websites. They are all partners to this effort and support it and are making uh, materials available. In the future, SAMHSA will have the materials on their website as well. Thank you all for participating, and thank you again, presenters. Thank you. Have a good Thank you. Goodbye. just because you're getting older.